Hi gang! I finally made a video about how to make this three-wheeled robot. It started out as this prototype, which some of you may remember. That was a platform for learning and trying things out. Now I have this more polished version, which I'll show you how to make step by step. And I've left in all the lessons I learned along the way. For example, the first lesson I learned was to instead of making it square, make it a circle. Why? Because if a square encounters an obstacle, the only thing it can do is back up. If it's a circle, then it can also rotate in place before trying another direction. To find a way to fit everything, I started by modifying my 3D model in Blender, the 3D modeling and animation software that I use. What are all the parts? Underneath, you can see that this robot has three wheels. One that is just a caster wheel, bought from a local hardware store, which turns and rotates freely. It's mounted on a 3D printed spacer to make it the right height. The other two are each driven by cheap TT geared motors. Each TT motor is mounted using another 3D printed part that I designed. Optionally, I have this motor encoder board, an encoder disc, that's used for measuring the speed of each wheel. That's mounted using yet another 3D printed part that I designed. And of course there are the big wheels. On top, on the side with the caster wheel, is the battery bank. In this case a RAV power cell phone charger. That was originally held in place using some 3D printed parts, though as you'll see, I later changed that to Velcro. I like this one because it has three USB ports for powering things. Each motor is connected to an L298N motor driver board. At the front is a US100 ultrasonic sensor for detecting if there are any obstacles in front. That's mounted on a small breadboard. This other breadboard is for connecting up the encoders. And it's all connected through this Raspberry Pi 4B. The first step in making it is to draw out the circle and two holes for the big wheels to stick up through. I start by drilling two holes in preparation for cutting the wheel holes. Then using my bench scroll saw, I cut out the circle. Then I put the blade through one of the holes I drilled and cut out the wheel hole. Notice that the corners take a bit of chewing, but I cut it all out. I do that for both of them. Here's the resulting starting base piece. Since my square version was just a prototype, I'd simply taped everything in place, including the battery bank. Now I want to do something more secure, so I originally designed these two support parts and 3D print them. I then drill the holes for one of them, and after bolting it in place, I measure where the other one should go. I drill those holes. I bolt that one in place loosely, slip in the battery pack, and tighten the bolts. The end result is secure. The battery bank can't come out. However, it's too wobbly for my liking, so I designed this third support. 3D print it, and once bolted in place, the wobble is gone. The next step is to mark and drill the holes for the three wheels. I start with the caster wheel. I lay the spacer in the correct place and mark the holes. To mount the motor, I designed this 3D printed part that the motor slips into. On the underside of the board, I carefully measure where that part should go. And using the 3D printed part, I mark where the holes should be drilled. I then drill all those holes. First for the caster wheel, and then for the two big wheels. I then bolt the spacer and the caster wheel in place, starting with pushing the bolts through, followed by putting the parts in place, and then putting on the washer, lock washer, and the nut for each one. After tightening those, I move on to the motors, again by pushing the bolts through. Some of these are a little tighter and take some screwing. And then I put a 3D printed part in place, and put on a lock washer and a nut. I do that for both of them. I then slip on the motors. That's followed by bolting those in place too, and tightening them. I next want to try with the battery in place, but I realize I made a mistake. As you can see, the screw head is in the way of this 3D printed battery support. Why? As you can see from this comparison, the screws were in the same place they were in the old version. But when I drew my 3D model, they're the opposite way. So I revised my 3D model by simply rotating the two wheel assemblies 180 degrees around the Z or Z axis. To fix the 3D printed battery support, I go into wireframe mode. I select the cylinder that represents a screw and the battery support. I invert the selection to select everything except those two things, and press H to hide everything else. I then switch to material preview mode, and carve out room for the screw and the battery support. Here's the new part. I then 3D print it. I can now add back the battery to see what I have so far. As I said, optionally I can put a motor encoder on it to measure the speed of the motor. The encoder I'm using is the HC020K motor speed sensor that consists of this small circuit board and an encoder disc. 
Some TT motors have a shaft only on one side for the wheel. To use this encoder, you need a TT motor that has a shaft on one side for mounting the wheel, but also a shaft on the other side for mounting the encoder disc. The circuit board needs to be positioned here relative to the disc, with the disc between these two parts. For that I designed this 3D printed part, to which I bolt the circuit board. After tightening, it looks like this. Then that whole thing gets bolted on here. Putting on the washer is hard, but putting on the nut is even harder. But I get it eventually and tighten it on. There should probably be a lock washer here too. Then I put the disc on the second shaft, but not too far. Here's the end result. Lastly comes connecting the wires. The ground first, then the output, then the voltage source. Lastly I put on the big wheels. And here it is with all the parts in place so far. Using values for my 3D model in Blender, I then mark the locations for the bolts for all the remaining parts, starting with the L298N motor driver board. Then comes the Raspberry Pi 4B. Note that I can do only three of the corners as the motor support is directly below the fourth corner. Next is the breadboard for some electrical components for the motor encoders. I first mark where the board will go. These boards have some sticky tape on the back, but I want to bolt them on. So using a large needle, I push a hole through and mark where to drill. I do the same for the holes for the breadboard for the US100 ultrasonic sensor. I then drill all the holes, starting with those for the L298N board, then the Raspberry Pi board, then the motor encoder breadboard, and lastly for the US100 ultrasonic sensor breadboard. I also drill some larger holes for running the wires from the encoders and motors on the bottom up to the top. Time to bolt on the boards. I don't like the way the L298N sits unevenly on the wood due to the parts on its bottom. For this board, I'm using 440 sized machine screws and nuts. I find that heat shrink tubing fits nicely over the bolts for use as spacers. So I cut four short pieces, one for each screw. I start by placing spacers on two of the screws and sit the screws in their holes. Then I slide each of the other two spacers over their holes and lower the screws in place. With a finger on each screw top, I put on a nut from the bottom. Then with a finger on the nut underneath, I use a screwdriver to tighten the screws. But I notice that the soft spacer material compresses too much, causing the corners of the board to go down while the middle is forced up by parts underneath. Not good. I don't notice this until much later in the development. And so later, I cut and sand some brass tubing. With that in place, the board is raised and remains flat. All the other boards use smaller diameter 2-56 nuts and bolts. The Raspberry Pi needs to be raised above this screw head. I make spacers for that by cutting insulation from this fencing wire. I'll show you later where I change that too, to use copper tubing instead. Here's the Raspberry Pi bolted in place at this point in the development. The motor encoder breadboard didn't need spacers, and neither did the US100 ultrasonic sensor breadboard. All the boards are in place. Wiring it all together comes next, starting with the L298N. I start by removing all the old wires from the L298N board that I used for my prototype version. I first run one set of motor wires up through a hole, and then the other set of motor wires up through another hole. I then tighten one set of the wires in place, and then the other set of wires. For powering the L298N board, my prototype version used this long USB cable that I'd adapted by putting connectors on one end that you can connect to. Now I wanted something shorter, so I got out this scrap USB cable, figured out how long I wanted it, and cut it shorter. Then I cut away the outer cover, pulled back the wire shielding, and cut it away, followed by pulling back the foil shielding, and cutting that too. I tried stripping the wires with my wire stripper, but the wire is too small, so I carefully stripped the black wire, and then the red wire. The white and green wires are for USB data. I don't need those. To do a quick test, I set my meter on the voltage scale. Note the alligator clips connected to the red and black USB cable wires. I plug the USB connector into the battery and connect the meter leads. The battery is not fully charged, so it shows less than 5 volts, but clearly it's working. I next solder on some thicker 24 gauge solid red and black wires of my own. These will also be more flexible than the original USB cable. To prevent the two exposed wires from touching, I cut up some heat shrink tubing and slide it on. I have only red tubing of this size. I get out a heat gun and shrink the tubing onto the wires. I was thinking of leaving it at that, but the very thin USB wires can break easily, so I wrap on a little electrical tape. Here's the new cable. 
I connect the red to the L298N's 5 volt input and the black to the power ground. I plug into the battery and you can see that the L298N's LED lights up. Next, to connect the L298N motor driver board to the Raspberry Pi. For that, here's the circuit diagram that I drew up. And here I make all the connections. Note that in the circuit diagram, there's this point where two ground wires are connected together before going to the L298N. I did that by putting both wires in the slot at the L298N. I later decide that I don't like that, because they can easily come out. So instead I have them both go to this breadboard and then have only one wire go to the L298N. The next step was to run a program on the Raspberry Pi to test out the motors. That's when I realized I had another problem. I tried to pull out the SD card and couldn't. Whoops! One of the battery supports was in the way. At this point I decided to try a different approach for holding the battery in place. In my BB-8 droid, I'd used Velcro to hold its large NICAD batteries in place. So I decided to use this roll of two-sided Velcro, one that sticks to itself, bought from a hardware store. The idea would be to put a strip or two across here, and another across here. But there was a problem with that. On this end, the Velcro would block the USB ports. That's why I went with 3D printed parts instead of Velcro in the first place. But I realized I could simply put some bolts or something sticking up here to block movement toward this direction, and put Velcro only part of the way in the other direction. So I start by removing the old battery supports. And then I mark where I need to make holes for slots for the Velcro to go through, followed by where I need to put the bolts on the end. I then drill two holes for one of the slots. I can't find most of my saw, so I rough it by using one of the blades to cut a slot between the two holes. A test with some Velcro shows that it'll work. For the next one I use a glove while sawing. And then I drill the holes for the bolts. I put one of the bolts sticking up to see if just one will do the job, which I later realize it does. Then I thread some Velcro through one of the pair of slots, and cut it to length. So far so good. I do the second one. I measure how long the end Velcro needs to be, cut it, stick it to the Velcro on the top, and then do the same with the Velcro on the bottom. battery is very secure. But it's still very difficult to access the Raspberry Pi's SD card. So I cut up some copper rods that I got from a local hobby store and used those as taller spacers. Now it's still a little bit of work, but much easier to access the card. Success! Before trying it out, I have a problem here where the cables from the battery could touch this wheel. So I use Blender again to design this wheel cover. I 3D print it. I then use some white gesso, a paint primer, to protect it from ultraviolet radiation from sunlight and make it last longer. After drilling more holes, I bolt it on. I like the way it looks so much that even though it's not needed, I make another one for the other wheel. But it also looks so nice that I decide to paint the base the same color, white. Here it is all painted. And here it is with all the parts back on looking pretty. Next, I wire up the US100 ultrasonic sensor to the Raspberry Pi. The resistors on the breadboard make up a voltage divider circuit. That's needed because the US100's echo pin can put out up to 5 volts, and the Pi's GPIO pins can handle only around 3.3 volts. The voltage divider circuit lowers the voltage. Looking underneath, the two HC020K motor speed sensors, or motor encoders, connect up through the base using these wires. To this last small breadboard through here, and here. Wires from there also go to the Raspberry Pi. And these resistors make up two more voltage divider circuits. Again, for converting from 5 volts to the Pi's required 3.3 volts for GPIO. To power the motor encoders using the battery, my prototype used this long cable I'd made up with a USB connector on one end and pins on the other end. But if I plug it into the breadboard and into the battery, you can see it's much too long. So I make up this shorter one instead. I plug that into the breadboard and the battery, much better. To clean things up, I have some twist ties which are wrapped around the wires in various places. I also need one here to keep these wires from hanging down too low, so I add just one above the hole. These connections up here can come apart, so I add one there on either end of the connections, holding them together. 
This is the USB cable for powering the Raspberry Pi. It has an adapter on one end for converting from micro USB to USB-C. And here I plug them all into the battery. What's neat is that for when the robot is not in use, I can tuck these loose cables underneath some of the Velcro. And here it is in action. If the ultrasonic sensor sees something within 30 centimeters or one foot, then it stops, rotates, looks again, and if it doesn't see anything, it moves. Otherwise it repeats all that. And using the motor encoders, I can tell when the motors are stopped, often because a robot got stuck. In that case, it can try something else, like rotate and try moving again. These features make the robot an autonomous robot. My prototype used a bunch of C language code to run it, but I decided to write up some Python code instead. All the source code, circuit diagrams, and so on are on my website. You can find a link to it in the video description. Well, thanks for watching. See my YouTube channel for more videos and tips for making stuff. If you like these videos, don't forget to subscribe, give a thumbs up, share with your social media, or leave a question or a comment below. Keep on watching.